Hey everyone, this is Christina Snyder from NCAI. We're going to start the webinar in just a couple minutes while we wait for people to join. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to run through a couple of the logistics. Um, good afternoon, everyone, or morning if you're on the West Coast. My name is Christina Snyder, and I'm a staff attorney with NCAI, and I'll also be your webinar administrator today. On behalf of NCAI, I'd like to thank you for attending this presentation on tribal juvenile justice, how a model code can inform local decision making. Before we begin the presentation, I'd like to go over some of our webinar features. First, you should see on your screen the PowerPoint for today's presentation. If during the presentation you experience any lag in slide transition, um, please just wait a few seconds because it might be the result of internet connection issues. Currently, with the exception of panelists, all audience phone lines are muted until the conclusion of the presentation. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, you may type it into the questions box on your webinar control panel. If you would like to ask a question over the phone, please use the raise hand option so we can unmute your phone line during the questions portion of today's webinar. If we are unable to answer any of your questions submitted through the questions box, we will follow up with you after the conclusion of the webinar. There are a few presentation materials attached to today's webinar as well. We've attached the model code for your use as well as a copy of today's slides. Finally, this webinar will be recorded so that we can continue to share this presentation with you and others not able to attend today. Thank you, and we hope you enjoy today's webinar. Great. Thank you, Christina Chamainwaka. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Malia Villegas. I'm the director of the Policy Research Center at the National Congress of American Indians. Uh, we're very grateful to our partners uh, for joining us in this conversation today. And I just want to provide a little bit of background about discussion fits in the broader scope of work um, that we are uh, engaged in at NCI and uh, with some of our partners that you'll hear from today. Uh, one of the big initiatives um, that we launched uh, last year in October uh, is the First Kids First initiative, Every Native Child is Sacred. And this effort uh, is a partnership between NCI, the National Indian Education Association, the National Indian Child Welfare Association, and the National Indian Health Board in order to uh, work to support tribes and American Indian Alaska Native organizations uh, and communities in putting our first kids first. And NCAI's role in that is really around governance. How do we support uh, tribes and tribal organizations in strengthening the capacity of their governing bodies to um, support the work of youth uh, and families and the needs of youth and families? So this effort today is uh, looking at these juvenile justice codes and a code development process in that space to help equip um, and celebrate the work of our communities on this front. As part of uh, that work, there are a couple of other efforts that I just wanted to draw your attention to that um, inform this presentation today. There's been a lot of work at NCAI and, and our partner organizations over the years around 
juvenile justice and youth and family needs. Uh, one of the big spaces was earlier this year in March, a group um, came together at Arizona State University as part of one of six hearings that the American Bar Association held on the school to prison pipeline with a particular focus on American and Alaska Native uh, youth. And so we were able to participate in that and there's some ongoing conversations about how to continue to work alongside uh, the legal uh, professionals to draw attention to what's happening um, in school facilities as well as the pipeline to uh, justice uh, facilities and how to curb that. So that's one piece that we're hoping to continue to steward and that this conversation will certainly inform. Uh, in addition, um, Judge Whitener uh, and DOI came together um, to present an earlier version of this presentation at our mid-year conference in St. Paul, Minnesota in June. And so this uh, webinar today is continuing some of that work. Our efforts with our conferences are not just to have these one-off conversations that don't have these follow-up uh, spaces, but to really make sure that we build momentum and try to contribute to um, ongoing capacity building and uh, identifying uh, places of, of real strengths. And then two other items I wanted to highlight. Uh, we released a infographic at the uh, March um, ABA hearing related to school to prison specifically that identified some real high need areas um, that were facing our American and Alaska Native youth that had over 22,000 unique opens on social media. So we're hoping to have some tweets uh, come out from this uh, conversation and opportunities to use social media to um, draw attention to the great resources and expertise shared today. Um, so we want to highlight that. And then this work around codes um, sits alongside of some of our other work uh, related to tribal public health law. We have the tribal public health law database on NCI's website where we feature um, what tribes are doing in different domains uh, and feature tribal codes. And so this work um, around, again, codes, policy, and governance is really uh, our effort to try to uh, strengthen some of that capacity and leverage the resources around that front. So we really look forward to um, hearing more from our partners today and to linking in with any of you um, on this, this range of efforts uh, in order to um, support our Native youth and families in, in, a, in a good way. So Koyana, thank you for taking the time today. And I'll turn it over to our uh, first partner, um, Judge Whitener, to share some of his really important work. Thank you for uh, asking me to participate today. Can, um, let me know if uh, the sound's problematic, and I'll uh, see what I can do on my end. Um, the what the presentation that I'm going to give today is how uh, we became involved in this process and how uh, we came to decide that um, the Model Indian Juvenile Code uh, that's being circulated and, and presented today uh, needed to be updated. And so we're going to go back and, and uh, discuss a little bit of the history of this code and where we are today. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. So the Model Indian Juvenile Code uh, is uh, was required by Congress um, back in the 1980s and 1986. Um, as you can see here, we have the code provision uh, that Congress passed that required the completion of this code. Uh, the Model Indian Juvenile Code uh, was created by a, a contractor in 1986. Uh, and it's uh, still, I think, an excellent uh, example of a, of a juvenile code, um, which I think is important for us to discuss the philosophy of uh, our effort. The, unfortunately, Congress used the term Model Indian Juvenile Code, which we uh, believe shouldn't be, uh, well, it shouldn't have been what it was uh, called, because there's no way to create a code um, that's a true model for all of the tribes in the United States. Um, there's no way to do that. And so this code, the way we look at it, is a, a, another example of a code uh, that when a tribe is, is seeking to either create a new code or revise an existing juvenile code. It's another uh, resource that can be used uh, when making the decision about how comprehensive uh, a particular tribal code should be, uh, 
what types of protections, uh, what types of services, what types of diversions um, a, a tribe may choose to uh, put in place. Uh, and I, I can talk a little bit at the end, we'll talk a little bit about all of the different resources that are available uh, for a tribe who's trying to do that. But the goal of this, at least for this particular uh, 2016 revision, is to provide another example code uh, for tribes to look at when they're making their uh, choices uh, when implementing a juvenile justice um, system. Next slide, please. The, uh, as part of this code as well, um, the uh, Department of Human Health and Services, DHHS, uh, and Department of Interior uh, entered into this uh, memorandum, uh, memorandum of agreement uh, to coordinate the prevention of treatment of alcohol and substance abuse uh, with Indian tribes. And part of this MOU, uh, as we can see, uh, the 12th point, uh, was for the model juvenile code um, to be to be created in cooperation, not just internally with Department of Interior, but also uh, with DHHS and Department of Justice, to try to provide a sample code for tribes to look at, which takes into account the kind of uh, options that a juvenile justice system needs to have for uh, a tribe to be able to uh, provide treatment. Um, and other interventions for really what causes the, um, the re really is the foundation of why we have kids who are coming into the system, um, either because of uh, their own substance abuse uh, at a young age uh, or some sort of correlation between uh, substance abuse and violence and other things that are happening in their lives, um, but to really try to make sure that the model code uh, recognizes that and isn't just a uh, process that tries to use retribution and deterrence as the uh, only focus of uh, juvenile code, uh, but provides ways of trying to treat the underlying uh, problems that lead to juveniles becoming system involved. Next slide, please. The other goal that we had was to uh, try to incorporate into the sample uh, a lot of the um, spirit of the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act. Uh, this, and, and not just the act, but also really what's come downstream from the act. Uh, this act was an attempt to provide a uh, systematic revision of juvenile justice system prior to the, the act. Um, Juvenile justice systems among in the states were very different, and often were very, uh, uh, very harsh in how they dealt with juveniles. So, with the passage of the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act, we saw the beginning of trying to create more restorative and rehabilitative processes for juveniles. Uh, and from our work with various tribes that uh, a lot of the tribes have made those changes in their codes, uh, but many have not. For instance, here in Washington and many of the tribes where I've uh, either practiced or sat as a judge, um, the codes are clearly not uh, in, at all informed by uh, things like the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act. Often they are just little mirrors of the adult criminal system, except that the juvenile doesn't have a right to a jury. Uh, but other than that, it looks exactly like an adult criminal system, including uh, in some places uh, still heavy use of detention uh, and things that uh, really research has shown won't cause the juvenile to have a better outcome as an adult. Uh, and so part of the, the goal of this revision is to increase uh, the uptake of tribes on some of the restorative justice models that the Act uh, both provided for in 1974, but also which has down the road resulted some research uh, funding that's come from uh, this act, as well as other work that's been done by the Department of Justice, um, Department of Interior, and uh, academic institutions. Next slide, please. So uh, the decision on why to update the 1988 code um, was 
because not that, the, and it wasn't because the 1988 code was a, a, a bad code. It wasn't at all. Um, and as a matter of fact, we recommend that any time a tribe is looking to adopt a new code or revise their own codes, one of the things that they should be looking at is that 1988 code. Uh, to be an, to, to give an example of, of one way to uh, have a juvenile justice system or to provide components that you may want to put into your juvenile justice system. But like, as, as this slide says, any law, lots happened since 1988. Um, the Tribal Law and Order Act, uh, for instance, the Affordable Health Care Act, the ACA, uh, and other things have happened. And so we, and as well as a lot of research that's been done and a lot of uh, programs that tribes and states uh, have tried uh, that we now have a little bit of research on. And so what we looked at this revision is for is, is, is a way to provide, again, another example, uh, but one that incorporates what's happened since 1988. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, down the road. So the, where this code came from, just a little bit of history on the code. Um, the, uh, currently, I'm the, sitting as the chief judge at the Tulalip Tribe, uh, which I uh, joined the bench there in uh, 2014. Uh, prior to that, uh, I was on the faculty of the University of Washington Law School, um, an executive director of the Native American Law Center there. Um, our focus there was to provide um, defense representation uh, to adults and juveniles in tribal court systems. Uh, one of the things that we noticed in the 1988 code uh, was that there really wasn't any dis much discussion about counsel uh, for juveniles. And one of the things that we really believe, and I think research shows, is that you have a much, much uh, better outcome if the juvenile is represented uh, during a delinquency or a truancy uh, or an at-risk youth or chins type of proceeding. And so what we wanted was to create a sample for tribes to look at that incorporated that into it. The other thing that we had heard, because we had gone out and, and had various meetings with tribes, uh, talked to tribal court judges, and one of the other things that we heard was that um, the existing codes in Washington State, at least, often didn't have diversion points uh, in them. Uh, that a lot of times the judges were diverting things out of the formal processing system, but didn't feel very comfortable because the code that they had in front of them that guided it didn't really provide for it. So they, were, they, they felt they were stepping outside of what their code said. Uh, and so we wanted a sample that would have the ability for, it would have the main um, system, but at, the, at pretty much any decision point along the way, whether it's pre-filing of any petitions, pre-adjudication of any uh, delinquency or truancy, predisposition or sentencing, uh, anywhere along the line, you could take a child out and move them into some other uh, process, whether it be a healing to wellness court or maybe a, a teen council or teen court, uh, whatever type of alternative, uh, a community accountability board, what, whatever type of alternative a tribe may want to do, we wanted to make sure that, that the, the, this sample code had an opportunity uh, for uh, getting the child out of the formal processing system. Uh, it also, want, I, we wanted it to have, um, to, to make it clear that detention of children should be really a last resort. Uh, and what we found many places was that uh, people, the tribes were using detention, and this certainly is not something that's unusual to tribes. States as well, in Washington State, my state, frankly, is one of the first, one of the worst offenders, I think, in terms of using detention for juveniles, especially in things like truancies. But what we see in the research that's been done is that that use of detention doesn't seem to improve the outcome. That that the use of detention, for instance to try to uh, encourage a child to go to school actually seems to have the opposite effect. It reduces the likelihood that the child's going to re-engage with education. We also, research studies that have looked at the use of detention in state systems find that uh, the, the, the heavy use of detention probably does not 
in decrease the likelihood of future offenses, but in fact probably increases the likelihood of future offenses. And so we wanted to, to have uh, a code that really stressed the use of least restrictive alternatives and close findings by the court that detention needed to be used. It certainly doesn't say that detention can't be used because we've, there, there are examples where the best choice for a child is the use of some sort of staff secure or detention facility. But it's in those cases where the use of that detention is in, you know, to keep the community safe or to keep the child safe. And that the court would need to make the findings of that, that it shouldn't knee jerk automatically to the use of detention for every adjudication of delinquency or every violation of conditions or every uh, uh, failure to comply with a court order. And, and we wanted to really have a code that, that made sure that the court makes those findings before it uses detention, then also makes that court go back and look at every child that they're detaining and making sure that those conditions are existing still. And if those conditions aren't existing still, that the child has to be removed from detention. Uh, and then in the, and because a model code is not possible, what we wanted to do also is that within the statutory language that we had for the code, you know, we have to make choices. It's impossible to do sort of a sample code and say, well, you could do this, or you could do this, or you could do this. You, it's very difficult to do that within the statutory language itself. So we made choices in what we put in the statutory language. But what we wanted to do was have a strong commentary that comes along with the code that discusses why we made the choices that we made in the statutory language, discusses other choices that other codes have made in a similar circumstance, and then examples of alternatives um, that tribes and states are using uh, instead of formal processing and detention, uh, and citations to research that supports the choices that we made uh, so that people who are looking at the code can go and look up and see why we made those choices or what the other options are to see when, the, when a tribe is just making its decision at that decision point of what it wants to do, that it's fully informed as, as much as possible uh, about what's going to be the best choice for that community. Next slide, please. Okay. So we, what we did is we, we were funded by the, the MacArthur Foundation to create this code. Um, and we published it. Uh, and, you know, we sort of walked away from it thinking, you know, that we, we'd done what we had wanted to do. But then we were approached by the Department of Interior who had seen the code and thought that, that it formed a good basis, not exactly perfect for what the revision of the Model Indian Juvenile Code was, but that it was a good foundation for a new revision of the 1988 code. And so the, uh, we were then, again, the, the, the statute allows for a contract with uh, someone to create these codes. And so the Department of Interior um, Office of Justice Services, Tribal Justice Support, uh, contracted with the Center of Indigenous Research and Justice uh, to convert the Native American Law Center code to the Model Indian Juvenile Code. Now, that you know, begs the question of what, what is the Center of Indigenous Research and Justice? Uh, that is the nonprofit that we created uh, because the dean of the University of Washington Law School, uh, while supportive of the expansion of the Native American Law Center into things like providing uh, public defender services and research on uh, sort of becoming more of a, like a think tank, uh, we decided that that was best in a nonprofit versus within the school itself. So the Center of Indigenous Research and Justice is a separate 501c3, but a 501c3 that's affiliated with the University of Washington Law School, uh, with the dean uh, having uh, the ability to appoint the vice president of the uh, center. So uh, I'm the president, and Professor Bob Anderson at the University of Washington Law School is the vice president of the Center of Indigenous Research and Justice. And so the work that we did at the Native American Law Center just moved over into this new nonprofit. And that's uh, the explanation of why now when we look at the older code, 
why it's housed at the Center of Indigenous Research and Justice. So once we entered this contract, uh, the uh, center uh, took as the foundation um, the model Indian Juvenile Code uh, and began having listening sessions. And so we took the uh, Center of Indigenous Research and Justice Code first. Uh, we took it to the, oh man, and now I'm blanking on it. Um, I don't know if Natasha can, uh, Anderson can send me a, a chat link. Uh, but we presented it to a group of uh, tribal court judges from all over the United States, as well as other court staff and policymakers, uh, and presented how the uh, code that was created by the Native American Law Center was structured, and to get their input. Uh, oh, there it is. Uh, yeah, we presented at the office, uh, o OBC National Tribal Nations Conference. And so the first thing we did was we presented the existing structure of the model that we created at the University of Washington, and they supported the, the structure. And the way we structured it was to separate out the, the code into essentially three areas with an overarching general provisions area that covers, um, covers whatever blankets across all of the other three areas. And so instead of having one single code that has everything in it, we split it out into, into four chapters, delinquency, truancy, and the at-risk youth code. The delinquency, again, is for delinquent acts. Uh, the truancy section, obviously, is for school. And then the at-risk youth code is, is for dealing with uh, more status offenses, things that uh, are not allowed because the child is uh, under the age of 18. Things like failure to, um, you know, abide by home rules, uh, run away, uh, things like that. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm fighting a cold, so I'm a little, uh, little hoarse today. So um, some of the, some of the goals of this uh, revision, uh, and we're now controlling as a 20, 2016 revision mainly because we weren't able to get it completely done in 2015, so it's going to be dated 2016. Um, you know, above everything and all, the, uh, the most important goal is to secure the care, protection, and welfare of the child. Uh, a juvenile justice system under the Juvenile Delinquency Act is, is mandated to not be retributive, but to be a rehabilitative, and that everything should be done not with punishing the child, even though some of the things that are within the juvenile justice code are going to be uh, things that are certainly not what you would want to do to a child, like put them in detention. But the reason why that detention is used is not to punish them for their act, but to try to either rehabilitate them or protect them or to protect those around them while you try to rehabilitate them. And so that is the overarching goal of this revision, is to secure the care, protection, and welfare of the child. The second thing is to try to preserve and retain family unity wherever possible. The, the fact is, is that uh, while it's really easy um, to say that when a child's actions can be really pretty safely pointed back to their living situation, their family situation, uh, the knee-jerk choice to remove a child from that situation which has a strong relationship to why they're maybe being delinquent or maybe being fluent. We have to recognize that the child is not necessarily going to understand that removing them from their family is in their best interest and in fact it could have the opposite result and make it much worse uh, for the child's outcomes in the future if you remove them that, from that. Uh, if you just remove them from that. So what we try to do is we're trying to preserve not only the, the, we're not only trying to help the child, but we're trying to preserve their family as well and provide services to the family whenever possible uh, to provide the best outcome for the child. Also then distinguishing between delinquent acts and the need for services, uh, and those things all wrap up together. I mean it is, you know, you will absolutely find children who are doing things that are bad things. And, then, and I, I'm, I'm not, you know, we can't sugarcoat it and assume that every uh, act that a, a child does is um, not, a, not an important thing or not a thing that harms people. Um, but we have to really look and discern which of those things are 
truly delinquent acts and which of those things are truly a need for services and then everything in between those two we have to try to push for services. Um, the fact is, is that what we don't want to do is react in a way that it's going to make uh, the child more dangerous in the future when they're a, and as an adult uh, make them more likely to be wrapped up in the adult system which clearly switches from uh, just being re rehabilitative to absolutely putting in a, a an element of retribution um, and if at all possible can we provide services while the child is under the age of 18 uh, to try to make a better outcome for when they're an adult so we focus on supervision treatment and rehabilitation uh, for the delinquent acts. Uh, we also try to develop process in the code ensuring the rights of the parties. Um, and the we, we truly, and it's true that I come from a, a criminal defense background, so as the individual rights uh, is sort of in my DNA. Um, but I, I truly believe that especially for juveniles, they have a heightened sense of what's fair. They're constantly going through a filter of how they're being treated and are they being treated respectfully and are they being treated fairly and depending on how they view how they're being treated, uh, it's really going to affect how much they buy into the system. And that's largely vested in brain science that we know about adolescents and their brain development. That, that as a child, they don't have the same ability as an adult to sort of say, well, look, I don't think I'm being treated fairly, but it's in my best interest to get through this, you know, get, deal, you know, engage with my services, uh, try to turn things around because I don't want to have this happen in the future. That cause and effect doesn't work as well for children. And so one of the things that we can do is to try to encourage them to buy in as much as possible and a big part of that is making sure that their perception is that they're being treated fairly. And one of the things that is going to come right out of the blocks as unfair to them is if they're sitting there without anybody to represent them and the, the prosecutor or whatever the presenting officer or whatever the person's called that's uh, uh, presenting the case on behalf of the government, if, if they don't have representation, I, I truly believe that they are not going to buy in right out of the blocks. And so ensuring the rights of the parties is important. Also ensuring the rights of the parents is important too. We've, you know, the fact is, is that a lot of times if you want to rehabilitate the child, you've got to engage the parents. And sometimes you have to somewhat force them in. And in the code, uh, one of the decision points we made was that at the point of adjudication of a child as delinquent or truant, the parents become parties and they can be ordered to uh, have, you know, to complete things as well. And so because of that, and because of, of the ability of the court to hold them in contempt or apply sanctions to them, there's also uh, provisions that we need to make for ensuring their rights as well. Uh, and then uh, the other goal is to try to coordinate these services, uh, to have um, systems so that uh, the court is fully aware of what services are available and to create systems so those services can be coordinated to maximize uh, the benefit of the investment that the tribe's making. Next slide, please. So one of the things, and this is a decision that um, a tribe can make, uh, that we made, and it's just the, the roles of, of who's doing what and what we call them. I think that's something that's important for, for uh, any jurisdiction to think about. Um, we wanted in the sample code that we're making uh, to really use language that's different than the criminal system. It's really easy to slide into using criminal terms uh, for juvenile systems, which, you know, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. I think it's a bad thing. I think that, that a juvenile system, if there's a way to try to make it as discernibly different from the adult criminal system as possible, I think we should do it. To the point of even choosing what we say. So we say, you know, in the code, instead of the public defender, we call them the juvenile advocate. Instead of the juvenile probation officer, we call them the juvenile case coordinator. Instead of the prosecutor, we call them the juvenile presenting officer. And so this, this is just an example of some of the language that we use. Um, and of course, this is one of the decisions that tribes can make as well. Uh, we, we wanted to make sure that those due process rights were protected. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that the uh, notice requirements were 
uh, pretty clearly spelled out on how uh, everybody was going to be uh, note have, have the opportunity of notice of what's happening. Uh, we wanted to make clear uh, what the uh, discovery rules were, uh, so that uh, what was being used uh, to determine whether or not a child is delinquent or not was something that the child would have, um, the child's family would have, and their their representation would have, so that they would be able to fully know what was uh, happening. Uh, again, the ability to testify, subpoena witnesses to introduce evidence, um, some cross examination. Uh, it's not a. It, we don't follow completely the rules of evidence for these processes, um, and so the the evidence rules generally are relaxed in in juvenile delinquency matters. Again, in theory, because it's rehabilitative and it's not. You know, we're not looking at trying to uh, take a pound of flesh from uh, from these kids. Uh, that justifies a little looser process, uh, and then also making sure that the findings that the court makes is based on the evidence that the court has. That we don't that we're not pulling in things that uh, aren't um, really before the court to make a decision on. Next slide, please. Uh, the again, as I said earlier, one of the things that was important to us when we did our code was that. Uh, the code provide an example of how a, how representation is embedded in a code. And so the code creates a right to appointed counsel uh, for the juvenile unless the juvenile family decides to go out and privately retain uh, representation. Uh, the other choice, again, and this is a decision point that we made was that the child or the parent guardian or custodian can't waive that right. When you look at other systems, there is the ability to waive the right to counsel, and that can be leveraged a lot of ways to encourage the juvenile or the juvenile's family to waive the right to counsel. So again, this is a decision point that the that a tribe has. The decision that we made in the sample was that this couldn't be waived. And then the uh, council has the ability to then go and get records uh, from the agencies of the tribe, whether if there's anything, because again, the purpose is to try to come up with whatever the disposition that's best able to handle what the child's needs are. Uh, it, it provides a wide range of access to be able to get information, to be able to provide the court the information it needs to, to structure the disposition that's going to address the needs of the child. Next. Detention is a big focus of this. Uh, we, um, again, as I stated in the area of um, delinquency, uh, detention is absolutely uh, available as an option with the, again, the, the caveat that it has to be clearly found that detention is needed either for the safety of the community or the safety of the child. Um, but we've, we've followed the recommendations. The most recent recommendations that have come out of research is that truancies should not have detention as one of the tools uh, to try to get the child to engage with educational services. And the reason is, is that the research that's been done doesn't find any, any tie between the use of detention and in, you know, re-engagement with educational systems. As a matter of fact, it reduces the likelihood. So if it doesn't, if it's not going to do what you want to do, you shouldn't use it. Um, and it's and this is a tough thing. And I've been in this situation where, as the judge, you know, you have a, a kiddo in front of you, and that kid won't go to school. And you have tried everything. You've tried community service. You've, you know, you've gotten mad at them. You've done this. You've done that. And the juvenile just will not engage. And it's really tempting to do that one thing that you can do that there's nothing that the juvenile can do about, which is order them to be grabbed, taken into, and locked up in detention. It, it's a tempting thing to use, and many states and many tribes use it for what we call status offenses. But uh, the research shows that it doesn't work. And so in the code, the, this sample, one of the decisions that we made was that it's not on the table for truancy. Now, it's important to understand that in truancy, it's also not on the table for states except for when the child violates the court orders. 
So you don't, the child doesn't go to detention, shouldn't be sent to detention just for the fact that they're truant. Uh, but there is an exception that allows it to be done for violating the court's orders, for instance, ordering them to go back to school and they don't do it. And then a court has the ability to use detention. But we, one of the choices in this sample is to take that off the table. The other thing is, is the area of shackling and solitary confinement. Um, one of the things that has been done since the 80s is the research in the, in the relationship between trauma uh, and violence and court involvement. And there's a clear correlation between trauma that's been uh, exerted on a child, violence that's been exerted on a child, and uh, future system involvement. What we don't want is that when we have to use detention, we want to try to reduce as much as possible the use of detention as being on its own an act of violence against the child and providing trauma to the child. And so uh, we discourage the use of shackling uh, and the use of solitary confinement. We're seeing a lot of research that's being done with both adults and juveniles where the use of solitary confinement is really messing people up. Um, and so it's even worse for juveniles uh, whose brains are developing. And if you, in, if, if you put them in that situation, um, especially when they're young, uh, it can have, I think, very bad outcomes in the future. And so, again, one of the choices that we made is in the use of detention, uh, that solitary confinement isn't, isn't appropriate. Next slide. So uh, we also banned derivative proceedings. Um, the, uh, some of the things that we have, you know, that we've, we've seen that uh, also uh, is a little discouraging is, um, and this is a common one, where there's, a, again, a, 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 someone's adjudicated and, uh, as with, of a delinquent act, and then they violate it, and then they get uh, a contempt charge. There's a, something in the code that provides for a separate delinquent charge of contempt for failing to file, uh, follow the court order, and then there's another delinquent charge. And so in the code itself, we try to keep within the process of a delinquency, everything should stay within that disposition. So if they're, if they're adjudicated and disposition orders are presented and then they don't follow those orders, then the goal of this sample code is so that the court has the tools it can do to try to reform the orders um, within the context of that single delinquency proceeding, but not to trigger new ones. So that's what these are, the goal of these provisions are. Next slide. So one of the things that we also did, and, and this is this was really from the work that I've done, and, and uh, one of the problems of, of that tribe face is the shifting landscape of what services are available. <laughs> As we all know, tribal uh, funding of services from the United States um, is largely dependent on grants. Uh, and so what that means is that the, the services come and go. Um, and the courts aren't always the first to know when a particular service no longer exists or if a new service has been created. And so what we, um, in the code, one of the things that we did was the juvenile case coordinator, which again uh, corresponds to the common term for a juvenile probation officer, um, they're required to sort of maintain an annual list of the services that are available at that time from the tribe, from the state, from the private, uh, from private organizations, but really to try to create a list, list of those resources available um, and disseminate them. And we like those for a variety of reasons. One, it keeps the court apprised of what's available, what kind of tools the court has in dispositions. Uh, for the youth and the youth's family, but it also provides an opportunity for even down to the level of the police officers, so that when a police officer is faced with a juvenile and a decision, you know, am I going to pick this juvenile up and take them to detention, or am I going to take this juvenile home? You know, it could very well be that they'll make the decision of let's, you know, let's take the juvenile home, let's provide the family this list of resources 
uh, and see if we can't um, head something off before we have to get completely system involved. And so that's one of the goals of this, this directory of services. Next slide. <clears throat> we also wanted to try to incorporate as much as we could the Affordable Care Act into this. Now that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, the Affordable Care Act is a, is a large statute. Uh, and the other problem is that it really varies from state to state with the uh, fact that states can opt in or uh, not of the Medicare uh, funding. Uh, the affordability of uh, insurance varies greatly from state to state. And so you can't really put in any one model uh, specific provision. Also, each state has the ability under the Affordable Care Act to structure how it jurisdiction delivers those services. Um, and so it's not uniform. But what we did was we wanted to provide the ability to screen juveniles for, for health insurance. Uh, and so that if there is an ability to do that, um, that insurance could be provided. What we're seeing with the passage of the ACA is more and more tribes using the ACA to supplement existing insurance through Indian Health Service or contract care. Um, at Tulalip, uh, we're doing things where we're shifting fines uh, to being able to be used for paying of insurance premiums. We're seeing uh, the tribes sometimes doing cost-benefit analysis and finding that it makes more sense for the tribe to pay for insurance coverage for individuals so that they can access those insurance costs to pay for treatment rather than those treatment costs coming out of uh, the tribal funds. And we're seeing tribes really leveraging the ACA. And so we wanted to make sure that the code had the ability to at least authorize the screening of juveniles for in insurance eligibility and, and provide that uh, ability of the court to use that as much as possible. Next slide. We're also trying to incorporate um, more trauma-informed uh, practices uh, into the code. Um, one of the, the one of the things that I think that the court should do is when when we look at the studies that have been done about exposure to trauma, um, children's exposure to trauma nationally is extremely high, and it's much even high. It's even higher when you look at just those juveniles who have become uh, involved in a juvenile justice system, and those percentages are so high that most. Uh, like the, the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges and other places are starting to tell the courts that you just need to assume kids have been trauma exposed, that they've either been subject to violence themselves or have been exposed to other people being uh, harmed. And research that uh, exposure has downstream effects. And so the goal of this code is to try to, again, make sure that the system itself isn't either inflicting harm and trauma or isn't exacerbating existing trauma. And so, again, it, 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 uh, it encourages the court to assume all juveniles are uh, trauma-exposed. It encourages trying to look at how courtroom environments are set up uh, to try to make them non-threatening, uh, trying to make them calm, trying to encourage the judge and the parties, uh, or the judge and the advocate and everybody else to be calm uh, and try to, to try to keep the uh, chaos out of the juvenile court as much as possible, which isn't certainly always uh, always uh, able to do, but if everything you can to do it, we should be doing it. And then also encourages safety procedures for all the parties in the court um, so that uh, when you have a child who's been uh, trauma exposed, that um, there's procedures there that they can see uh, so that they feel more comfortable and more safe when they're in the, in the, in the court. So we're in a pre-federal register taking comments. The code is available. It's, we've been updating it as we've taken comments in from various uh, presentations. Uh, we've made changes to the versions of the code, uh, as well as expanding out the commentary. Uh, but the most current discussion draft is available at uh, this website. Um, we uh, are encouraging anybody who wants to 
comment to make a comment to us. Um, and then what we will do is we'll to finalize a draft version of the code uh, and put it into the Federal Register. Um, and then we'll wait and get comments back from that and we'll work toward publishing uh, the final version of the 2016 version of the Model Indian Jewel Code. Um, oh, and there's one thing I wanted to forgot earlier, because this is a question that's been brought up a few times, is if you look at our code, there's really no discussion in it about traditional justice. Um, and that was, there was a reason for that. Just as a model code can't really be created in uh, every tribal jurisdiction, nor can I think a model code uh, provide provisions for the use of traditional justice. That's something that um, each tribe will have to do. Uh, and seen at many tribes is the creation of a uh, formal process in the middle, but then relying on traditional forms of justice as alternative. And that's why we wanted those those diversion points throughout the formal code so that when it has a traditional form of justice and you can divert the child right out of the main system right into that uh, traditional form of justice. But again, that's something that's going to be very specific tribe to, uh, based on their custom and tradition. So that's why that's not in the code. Um, other resources that are available for tribes that are looking at this, the tribal the Institute uh, has created a um, juvenile justice resource. Um, I'm blanking on the formal name of it. Uh, but basically, it's a, it's a workbook where you collect various examples of juvenile justice codes. And it, what it does is it provides a process for a court uh, or a tribe to go through to make those decisions they're going to have to make to come up with a tailored uh, code that works for a specific uh, uh, jurisdiction. So I encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, if you have comments, please send it to this email address. Um, and uh, thank you for uh, letting me present today. Thanks, Ron. Um, next week, we're going to have Jack Trope from Casey Family Programs present, but he's having connectivity issues, and he apologizes that he won't be able to join us. Um, so he'll follow up with materials for um, participants. Uh, next we'll have Natasha Anderson and Addie Rolnick um, present on reviewing and updating tribal juvenile codes, some of the process and resources. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think it's not morning for anyone anymore. Uh, my name is Addie Rolnick, uh, so we just wanted to each introduce ourselves really quickly and then we'll talk you through um, a few slides about uh, focusing more on sort of the process at the individual tribe level. Um, so by way of introduction, my name is Addie Rolnick. I am a professor at the Boyd School of Law in Las Vegas. Um, and one of my main areas of research now is juvenile justice in Indian country. Um, and a lot of the research I do sort of builds on work that I've done, both kind of advocating at the level of federal legislation and, uh, and agency policy for better resources for tribes, and also working sort of as a consultant for tribes in improving juvenile systems. Uh, so I've kind of worked on all ends of these. And the, the recommendations that, that I'll give you in a minute will sort of draw on and try to simplify um, some of the things that I've seen. Um, so I'm going to let Natasha introduce herself, and then we'll move on. Great. Um, thank you, Professor Ralnick. Um, good afternoon, and um, I guess late morning, everyone. My name is Natasha Anderson. I work for uh, CIA Office of Justice, Justice Services and Tribal Justice Support, which is basically the um, tribal courts division. We do work to support tribal courts. Um, I'm a member of the Ponca Tribe of Nebraska and the Senate of the Sioux Tribe and a NCAAI alum. So um, I very much appreciate the work that NCAAI does and continues to do in the field of juvenile justice. And um, I just wanted to thank everyone and I hope you'll take the opportunity to submit comments on the uh, discussion draft of the code that um, Judge Whitener just presented on. Um, that's uh, my main interest here is, is getting the input and casting that net as, as wide as possible um, so that we can put something out there that will actually 
be useful um, to tribes to use as they update or create their regional codes. So with that said, I'll turn it to Professor Wilnick. I know um, there's some great uh, tips in the sense of the process and resources that uh, have been gathered. Thank you, Natasha. Um, so I guess I, I want to start by saying, so the, the model code is, is big, um, and I'm not sure how many of you who are on the call uh, have had a chance to look at it, I would really recommend um, taking a good look at it and I think uh, submitting comments, uh, you know, there's a lot that's really strong in that code and I think comments would improve it. But I actually, you know, in, in deciding to participate in this and thinking about what I could do, um, there's not a whole lot more to add in terms of uh, sort of ideal practices uh, besides what I think is already in the draft. So I think that the um, those working on the code have done an incredible job in sort of creating uh, a really good model. And so what I thought that I would focus on um, is is thinking about, well, how do we implement this model or, or, or sort of think about this in a particular community because that's actually, that can be a really difficult process. So, you know, I guess I want to start with a couple observations, which is that I've been doing this uh, working in some way with tribes on uh, juvenile justice issues for um, maybe 15 years now. And when I started, there were a couple of things that really struck me, and one of them is that at that time there were not really any partnerships between organizations in the juvenile justice community outside Indian country um, who were sort of working on best practices for youth and tribes. And so a lot of tribes that I worked with, for example, um, and, I, and I don't say this to, um, to target uh, the Bureau in particular, but they would work with agencies and the agencies would connect them with technical assistance providers who would then kind of push the tribes in the direction of doing very punitive codes or punitive systems. And there's a lot of reasons for that that's complicated. Um, but I knew from my work in juvenile justice that that's not what everyone was saying uh, in that field was best. So people have been saying for a while now that detention, for example, is not great for kids. And so it was. I was really struck by this sort of failure to have any partnerships between uh, nonprofits who wanted to give grants and wanted to give training and were doing research and tribes who were trying to work on their codes and work on their systems. And that's really changed, right? So so now there are there is a much better connection uh, between, you know, NCAI and the Bureau and the Department of Justice and uh, foundations like MacArthur Foundation um, and I'll talk a bit about juvenile detention alternatives initiatives. So so there's a much better link and so what we're seeing is a draft like this model code, which is being sort of suggested as something that tribes might be able to use, is much more reflective of kind of the current thinking in juvenile justice, and then also sort of the current thinking in uh, in terms of tribal justice systems. And that wasn't true, you know, 10 or so years ago. So this update is really important uh, in that way. And so I, I, I'll give a little bit of, of um, at the end of talking through the process, I want to give a few resources, which are just some additional places that I look um, for help in uh, information in doing this kind of work. Um, but I think actually the the group that's putting together this code has done a good job of kind of linking up all the resources that are out there. So, okay, uh, next slide or first slide. So, what I want to sort of think about is you 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 might want you, many of you might be thinking that you want to improve your systems or you want to build a system and there's this massive model code uh, and maybe it's useful and maybe it's not um, and maybe there's something specific and maybe there's more that you want to put in it and I want to sort of, I don't have a whole lot of time but what I want to do is kind of try to simplify what I think is the good process for going through this. So having a model code is important um, and I use models all the time right when when drafting uh, so I don't think you need to start from scratch and this is a very good model but really what's important especially in juvenile justice is figure out what it is that you need in your community and try to build a system that reflects that and that's you know sort of many times the opposite happens uh, in tribal courts um, so and tribal justice systems so we we have federal officials and state officials and the tribes are kind of left trying to patch the holes there instead of actually being able to think what is it that we want to do and how can these other governments help us do that and so I think in particular with juvenile courts it's really important um, to slow down and do that process so instead of saying there's a grant out there how can I 
build my system to fit what the grant wants, um, to sort of say, what is it that I need, and then, you know, that we need in this community, and then what is then a resource that's available to sort of help us build this. So I'm going to, I have a sort of a six-step process. It's very simplified, but I just want to kind of talk through that to get everyone thinking about maybe the work of incorporating and how to use a model code. So the first thing is assessing community needs. So before, before a code is revised, before a code is updated, before a new code is drafted, before any facilities are built, before a grant is applied for, ideally any community would look at what was going on there and sort of say, what do we need? So if youth violence or youth crime or youth getting in trouble is an issue, which it is in a lot of communities, what exactly is the issue and what, what is everyone seeing? So um, things like, well, the most important thing I think actually is what is what are kids actually getting in trouble for? So in a lot of communities, for example, most of the kids are getting in trouble for low-level alcohol-related truancy type offenses. If that's what's going on, there's a kind of a system that you might be able to build to respond to that, and it might not be the same as if you have a lot of murders committed by youth. So look at what the kids are actually mostly getting in trouble for. Um, the other thing that I found I think is really important is what do you have in, t in your community in terms of the facilities and the arrangements that you use to actually make your system work. So if you need to put someone, before the code is updated, if you need to put someone in jail for a short time, in detention for a short time, or for a long time, where are you sending them? How many police does it take to escort them there? How long does it take to get them there? So if you are far from any kind of detention facility and you have to use your only police officer to escort kids there and back every time they're arrested, um, that might suggest a need for something uh, in the community. Um, when, what's used for secure treatment. So if it's not incarceration but some kind of mental health or drug and alcohol treatment that's secure, is there anywhere that you have to send youth for that? Um, is there anything in your community for what I call shelter care, which is, you know, if a child needs somewhere to go, um, whether they run away or they um, need to be removed for sort of child welfare reasons, is there somewhere safe for them to go? Is there a building that they can go to that's not a detention facility? Um, and then what's used for non-secure treatment? So if you want to you know, put a child in an alcohol or drug abuse program or in a mental health program, even if it's not a secure facility, do you have anywhere to send them and where is that? And sometimes those are local and state facilities, sometimes they're for other tribes, sometimes they're bureau facilities, sometimes they're already in the community. But what's out there? Because you need to build a code around what it is that you can reasonably do um, in the community that you have. Um, the other thing to look at is sort of what community-based resources are available. So for non-tribal communities, this is like the churches and the boys and girls clubs and the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts and a lot of state and local justice systems are built around using all of these community resources so you divert a kid into a Boy Scout program. Um, some tribal communities don't have as many of those sort of community organization resources but many communities actually have for example some kind of traditional system. Um, so if there is um, a particular relative whose job it is to guide kids um, or if there is, uh, a, so I've worked with a community where um, it was organized in whaling groups um, and the whaling captains there were responsible for sort of some kind of guidance. So if there is something in the community that is not necessarily like a Boy Scout organization but an existing structure that can be used, consider sort of looking at that and using that. Um, it can be used um, sort of to build a juvenile justice system around. Um, and then. Uh, we talked a bit about um, traditional approaches, but you know, our traditional approach is something that the community wants to incorporate in the code um, and in the juvenile system, and if so, what are those practices? So what is um, the particular tribe's view on how to raise children, how to discipline children? And this is not, of course, an easy question, so there's going to be arguments about what the sort of um, correct community approach is and what's traditional and what's not, but it's worth discussing for that community, and I think that's why it can't be in a model code um, because uh, every community has sort of a different approach to this. But what what sort of traditions might want to be incorporated? That includes both kind of the process and the people involved and the substance. So what kind of standards would be it? Um, and then other practical limitations. So is there anything else like not having much money to devote to the project or um, not having any buildings um, or not thinking that you can get a grant to build a building uh, or only having one police officer. All of those things are kind of practical limitations that would guide what kind of system you want to build. Um, so next slide, please. 
Um, okay, so you've looked at ideally, and I know that this is ideal in the sense that many times we're working under different time constraints, but ideally you've got a sense of what your community needs. Um, then if you've got a code already that you want to update, um, where did that code come from? So it's worth looking at that code and trying to figure out what is wrong with it, and I'll, I'll explain in a minute that maybe you just want to scrap it and maybe you want to update it, but um, where did it come from? So a lot of tribes that I've worked with to update criminal or juvenile codes, sometimes it's not clear in terms of the history where the code came from, and it might have been borrowed from the state, it might have been uh, you know, drafted as a process by uh, people, by tribal leadership, or it might have been uh, sort of borrowed from another tribe, but um, it's worth kind of thinking about where, what you're using, and especially if you're using a code that was just um, handed over by someone as a, as a duplicate of kind of a neighboring state code or something, those tend to be worth updating because it suggests that there's not much in it that the community is particularly committed to. So where did it come from? Um, is it, when was the last time anybody looked at it? Um, and then some of these substantive things. So um, what does the code say about when youth can get out of the system? Um, the, we talked a little bit earlier about you know, the importance of kind of diverting youth out at different stages, but in the existing code, does it just you know, funnel someone through the process, or are there different places where the, the, um, the youth can exit the system? Um, when can they do that? How can they do it? Do they have to plead? Um, does it happen earlier? Um, so what, what's going on now? Um, what dispositions are used? So that means detention um, and, and also things like secure treatment, but fines or probation. So what are the different disposition options that the code that you're using now gives you? And does it match what is actually happening? So are the attorneys doing anything that actually matches what the code suggests, or are they only using one disposition option? Um, what rights are protected, right? So the current juvenile code, um, does, it, does it have robust protection of individual rights, things like right to counsel, um, or does it have um, sort of a take a more informal, informal approach that doesn't necessarily guarantee those rights? Um, and then again, when and how are sort of alternative approaches, therapeutic approaches, so I mean like treatment, um, and traditional approaches being used in the current code, and maybe the answer is not at all, um, but you know what's there and what are people doing? And then how does it interact with other codes? And this becomes important sort of at the end. So if there's a juvenile code, um, and then there's a criminal code, and then there's a wellness code, um, look at your codes together. So do you have to go to criminal court and then get diverted to juvenile court? And does the juvenile code sort of allow for that? Or do kids go straight to juvenile court? Is it related to, is it the same system as your child welfare system? Um, is it, if there's a wellness code, can juveniles be processed under the wellness code? And does your juvenile code allow for that kind of diversion? So especially if different codes were adopted at different times, um, for example, uh, many times there would be a, a sort of a wellness diversion program or a drug court that doesn't actually have any provisions for putting youth in. And if it's possible for youth to do that, it can be useful to sort of divert, um, use the juvenile code, sometimes divert some youth into the drug court. Um, and if you didn't adopt all those codes together, sometimes you need to back up and look at how they are fitting together now. Um, and I like to, um, in these situations, make a flowchart of the existing code. Um, so draw a little diagram that shows how one person might move through the system. Um, and that is a really helpful way to kind of figure out what's going on in the current system. So you've looked at what it is uh, that the community wants. You look at what it is that's going on now. The, the process of trying to make it better, I think, then starts with meeting with everybody who cares, right? Meet with stakeholders. So um, this includes youth who've been in the system and youth who haven't. Um, you can get a lot of really good information by talking to youth about what they think has worked and what hasn't. Um, police, mental health professionals, anyone who does substance abuse treatment in the community, um, including those who work with adults and those who work with juveniles. Um, anyone, social workers and child welfare workers tend to have a lot of knowledge about what's going on with the kids. Um, anyone in the sort of court system, judges, prosecutors, defense attorneys, lay advocates, um, whatever title you're using for um, attorneys and judges in the system. Um, educators, so um, teachers and people who, who do other kinds of education related work, again, these people tend to have a lot of knowledge about what's going on with kids and what would be useful. Um, elders or any other kind of community leaders that you may want to involve who aren't necessarily directly related to um, directly dealing with youth on a day-to-day -day basis, but who might also be useful. Um, and then after you've looked at uh, sort of talk to everyone and tried to figure out what the priorities are, then I think that's the time to sort of look at the models that are out there. So this, to me, is where the use of a model juvenile code comes in. So the model code is, I think, an incredible 
document. Um, and I think at the same time, it's a mistake to pick up what everybody says is a good model code and then just fill in the blanks. Um, so using a model code, no matter how good the model code is, should come after the community has already figured out what it is that they want to do sort of in a broad sense. Um, then you pick up this model code. Um, it's worth also looking at other tribes' juvenile codes um, at state codes, right? So if there's a neighboring state or local code that you can look at, it might help um, you see what's going on in that community. It doesn't mean follow everything, but they can be helpful. Um, and then maybe looking at kind of best practices in juvenile justice. So I actually think the advantage of this model code is that it allows, um, it allows people to skip a little bit of the other steps. So the drafters have actually done a lot of this work of looking at best practices um, and of looking at uh, at what other codes are doing, um, but it can still be useful to do that. And especially if you know a tribe that has a similar sort of population profile and resource profile that you do, that that, that, that code can be useful. So maybe it's simpler um, and it fits better. Um, so then you want to identify the priorities. Um, so one of the first things is, at this point, when you've looked at your old code and you've looked at what you think you want the new code to be, do you want to start over or do you want to amend the I actually think as a code drafter, it's very it's way harder to amend an existing code than it is to just start fresh. Um, so if you don't like what the existing code is doing and you have a good model, um, it's worth just sort of redoing the entire code. Um, and the other possibility is to amend what it is uh, that you've already been working with to sort of incorporate new provisions. And then you want to think about all these big questions. So what is the role of incarceration that you, you want in your code? Um, what is the role of treatment? Is that going to be part of your juvenile delinquency or is it going to your system or is it going to be something you handle elsewhere? Um, how can existing resources be used? So whatever you felt like you had in your community, how can those be used in the code? Um, do you need new buildings or new programs, right? So maybe you want to build a code that allows you to sort of go to a safe place and you don't have a building for that. So that's the building that you need then. Maybe you need a new courtroom. Maybe you want to use detention and you don't have juvenile detention. So what kind of buildings are you going to need and what kind of new programs? Um, what kind of traditional approaches are you going to want to put in here? Um, are you going to want to use traditional approaches at all? Um, and then do you want to use outside assistance um, in the process of drafting, right? So I will um, say a bit more about this in a minute, but um, this can all be done without people helping from outside, and it can be done completely by people helping from outside, and I think it can be useful to kind of think about the extent to which you want to or need to do that. So how much time do people have? Is there anyone who can actually write the draft, um, and, or who wants to sort of be involved and direct the process? And I'll say one thing before we go on to the next slide about this question of the role of incarceration. So this, um, it, it used to sound more radical. It actually sounds less radical to say this now after um, the approach that the model code has taken. But I just want to suggest that it's possible you don't need incarceration at all in your juvenile system. Um, so the, the recognized uses of detention um, for juveniles, for locking them up, um, one of them is public safety. right? So if you need to lock up a, a, a young offender who's committing dangerous offenses to keep the community safe, um, it's pretty much widely agreed that that's a, um, a good use of detention or a, an OK use of detention. Um, one of the other ones that was mentioned earlier was the idea that you might need to lock up a kid to keep them safe. Um, I would urge you to think about what that means. Um, so if, for example, you have a suicidal kid, um, consider it's not clear to me how locking them in a jail cell would actually help them. Um, so there may be better ways to assist or protect a kid from themselves than using detention. Um, and this could be non-secure treatment or secure treatment, hospitalization. Um, so what are you using incarceration for? And if you don't have the kinds of offenses that you need to keep the community safe from, and you don't, um, and you don't think that it's very useful for trying to keep kids safe, it's, it's pretty clear that it's not a good tool of rehabilitation in most cases. Um, and so then what you're left with is using detention as, as a punishment, which, um, which is what we've, we've just heard is something that um, it, it's suggested, and especially in the model code, that we don't do with juveniles. So we try to rehabilitate them instead of punishing them. But I think it's worth real careful thinking about why are you using locking up kids um, as part of your code. It's just what we do reflexively, I think, in many cases. But um, it's, 
it's clear in terms of the research that um, detention should only be used when it's necessary, and there's actually fewer cases than many of us think where it's actually necessary. And so if you are dealing with a subset of offenders who are committing low-level crimes, or if the juveniles who are committing worse crimes are actually being processed in the federal or state system, um, then consider the possibility of not having detention at all. Um, and, and so I think that it's worth asking whether you need to use lockup at all. So it's, I say that because many systems are built around detention because it's expensive. So getting the money to build a jail if you don't have one, um, doing all that you need to sort of make it high security and then provide health services and education services in that lockup is a really expensive thing. And what we tend to see is that the whole system then is built around that um, because it's the most expensive part of it. And instead, we could divert all those resources to making much stronger non-detention programs. So I say consider really carefully whether you need incarceration at all. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so then we get to the part where you want to write the law. Um, and so here, maybe what you're doing is you're using a model code. Maybe what you're doing um, is you're starting from scratch. Maybe you're amending the code that you have. But in any case, you want to create a draft. Then you want to look around and say, okay, to do what we want to do in this draft, what additional resources do we need? So does this draft require that we have a new building? Does it require that we have a new program or that we hire new staff? Um, and make sure that you sort of are thinking about how to do that because you can't implement the new code until you've done that. Um, present it to the stakeholders. So whoever in your community is going to be reviewing this, whether it's just the council or whether it's a much broader um, set of people, um, and invite feedback. So the same way that it's happening with this model code, then revise it, then repeat it again and again and again until it's something that um, can be passed. Um, once it's done, uh, we come back to the issue of how it interacts with other codes. So once you have a juvenile code that you like, go back and look at the rest of your law and figure out if there's anything. So does your jurisdiction provision comport with what it says in the juvenile code? Does your criminal code match it? Does your criminal procedure code match it? Does your wellness code match it? Maybe all your codes are written separately so you don't need that overlap, but go back and check whether you need to amend other sections of other codes to, uh, to update to match what you've done with your juvenile code. And in this slide, if you're looking at the slide, you'll see that a couple of these are bold. So create a draft, revise the draft, and amend the related provisions. Uh, one thing that, one question that I get when training um, sort of tribal personnel in doing code updates is, is you know how much to use lawyers, um, and it can be paid lawyers, it can be legal services lawyers, it can be um, clinics. There's a lot of law clinics uh, at UNLV and elsewhere that sort of do this sort of work, and. These are the places where I think that if you're going to use outside assistance, some kind of lawyer, this is where it's the most helpful. So drafting an actual code, revising a draft of an actual code, and amending related laws, those are things that lawyers do really well, and sometimes they can be a real pain and take a long time for non-lawyers to do. The rest of it, trying to figure out what the community needs, um, trying to identify what, where the money should go and, and what should be prioritized, that's not a job that's done well by lawyers necessarily. So if you want to bring in outside people, these are the places where I would say it's probably best to do it, although you might have people involved already who can handle that um, internally. Um, okay, next slide, please. So, I mean, that was a quick overview of what I think is a, pr it's a good process, and I emphasize it just to say, I mean, I don't know that I can say much more about making the model code better. I think it's a very good code, but every community still needs to figure out what they want and how they can use that code. So that code may have provisions that people disagree with, it may need to be changed, and it may be just too big um, for what that community needs or not match their law. So I emphasize sort of the process of kind of how to go about making these kinds of changes. The next couple of slides, which I won't talk through in great detail, just have um, resources that I use. Um, so this isn't uh, an official list of all of the possible resources out there. Many of them are probably resources that people use already. Um, but the first couple of slides are tribal law resources. So when, um, when I teach students how to research, uh, you know, how to find tribal codes and how to research good tribal law, we don't have a lot of collections that tell us what the good codes are, what are the model codes out there. That's why a model project like this is important. But there's a lot of places where you can go to find other tribes' codes um, and to just look and say, what are various tribes doing? Um, it's, you don't know whether it's good or bad until you look at it, but it's worth looking around to see what, um, what tribal law resources there are. So the first two slides are those. Um, if you could move to the next one. So this is the second. And actually, These are, go ahead. sorry, Professor Ronald, Natasha. Um, Christina, do you mind going back to the first slide? 
Um, I just wanted to highlight, and I, I'm glad Professor Ronit was included on these resources, uh, particularly Tribal Law and Policy Institute, who has worked with the OJJDP, Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. And they, um, Christina has the link, they've developed a really terrific workbook that kind of the steps that Professor Rolnick just discussed, um, it, the workbook does that and it cross-references several tribal codes. So I encourage you to go to Tribal Law and Policy Institute's website and take a look at their workbook. It actually incorporates um, the code that Judge Whitener was referencing today and is a really good, is it, as um, Professor Ronick said, you know, is another good resource to gather so that you can get as many um, things to look at to find what is going to work for your tribal community. Thanks, Addie. Yeah, thank you. Um, and and I so you, uh, so the next the second slide of tribal law resources, um, and it's helpful to hear what others use here. This is just my general collection of possible places to go, um, and it's pretty broad. Are not so much places where you can find codes, but are more kind of other resource centers. So the the ones on the previous slide, like um, the Tribal Law and Policy Institute, also have resources. These are a couple of so there's a couple of the sort of school clinics on here who have pretty good websites um, that link you to um, a bunch of additional resources. Um, Tribal Justice Resource Center and the Tribal Judicial Center um, all have some resources to some extent. Um, these are my general places to go for looking at tribal law resources. So some of these have you know more or less in terms of juvenile codes specifically. Um, but it's you know I've just collected a set of links that I use um, to to send people to to do this kind of research. So until we have a really good system for identifying uh, sort of model codes and searching them, um, this is sort of how you have to do it. And then the last one, please. This is um, again a really quick overview, not exhaustive. And I think here there may be other people who can add additional resources, but I just wanted to sort of put together a couple of main links to places that I thought had good and comprehensive juvenile justice specific resources. So uh, most or all of these are not tribe specific, so there's not necessarily going to be anything on these sites that is um, done for uh, for the Indian country context specifically. A few of them do have resources like that, but mostly this is just general juvenile justice kind of best practices and guidance. Um, so we talked a bit about the MacArthur Foundation's Model for Change, Models for Change project, and so the website for that is here. There's a lot in there, um, but again, it's just a project sort of um, directed at and, and in the past has given grants to um, improving juvenile systems. Likewise, the Casey Foundation's Juvenile Detention Alternatives Initiative, which is the first link, is um, sort of an organization or, or, or a, a foundation that's devoted to helping mostly states, but also tribes, um, jurisdictions to move kids out of, you know, to use detention less in their system, so to overhaul their systems in a way that uses detention um, less. And they, they have had, um, there is kind of a pilot tribal JDA project. Um, and I've looked around a few times at the website, and I'm not sure how much of those materials are up. It's a relatively new endeavor, but they're sort of a, um, they're actually working to come up with a model JDAI for Indian country, um, working with one or two tribes. So um, if there's not a lot um, in tribal communities there, there may be in the future. Um, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention has a model programs guide. Again, sort of a similar, this one points to particular kinds of programs that they've decided are models. Um, and so, so it can be a good place to look for other sort of examples. Um, the National Center for State Courts similarly has a site sort of devoted to overhauling juvenile justice systems. So you might sense a theme here, which is that everyone in the country is now sort of realizing that their juvenile systems don't work that well. They're too reliant on detention, and everybody's trying to sort of update them. Um, and so there's a lot of resources for that. Um, a the resources at the bottom are actually about specific practices. So um, I'm, my purpose here is not to say, what are the best evidence tested practices or what are the what practices should be used but i wanted to just point you to resources for a couple of um, types of processes and practices that i've heard can be useful um, so uh, the first one is family group decision making which is sort of a um, a, a kind of procedural model for making decisions mostly it's used i think now in the child welfare context but it actually can be applicable in the juvenile context and this is just one website it's a government-sponsored one, so I think it's safe. That gives you some um, some resources and some more information about what that model is. Um, it's mostly used in New Zealand, but a lot of child welfare systems here have started to use it. And then the last two are 
there's a you probably have heard a lot about the idea of trauma and trauma informed care. Um, my field is not actually to do research in sort of the the medical treatment side of it, um, but I wanted to sort of point you to a couple of sites that gather more information. So when you hear about how it's important to take youth who have experienced trauma and give them what's called trauma informed care, it's worth asking what that is. Um, and so SAMHSA has a website that uh, that is supposed to sort of be an information clearinghouse for trauma informed care. And then there's an independent project called the Trauma Informed Care Project. So this is just a couple of places to look if you're really interested in sort of learning more about um, different new relatively new practices. So that's all I have in terms of resources, but um, mostly I think Natasha and I are both here to serve as resources and answer questions. So we're up at the end of our time, but we're willing to keep you on for a little bit if people um, have questions or if you have to run, you can always type questions into the question box and our software will log those questions and we can follow up with you later. If you'd like to ask a question, um, just press the raised hand symbol and we'll unmute your line. We got a question about getting access to the PowerPoint, and um, we'll follow up and send you all a copy of the PowerPoint that you can print out. There is um, a, a slide notes version that's attached to this webinar if people think that's useful. Okay, I'm not seeing any raised hands, um, so. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, and we'll wait just a couple minutes to make sure that make sure that we're talking to everybody. So we have a question in the questions pane. Do any of the presenters know of specific tribes who have really good functioning juvenile courts? Judge Whitener, are you still on? Because I think this might be a good question for you. Yeah, there are. Um, Puyallup is one that I think uh, you could take a look at. Uh, they've gone through a lot of effort to uh, revise their codes um, and have, have put in processes uh, there. Um, that's one that leaps out at my at my uh, mind. Uh, there's a lot of tribes that are going through this process right now. Um, unfortunately, the the it's, it's been something that's been fairly recent in terms of, of justice reform at tribes. There's been a lot in the area of, of economic development and corporations, and they're now looping back around uh, to this. And that's why we're seeing, we're partly because it's, there's funding for it now uh, to a certain degree, uh, and there's more resources for it now. I think there's a lot of places that are going through the process. Um, but the one that jumps out at me right now is, is Puyallup. And, and I, is I, I would concur. I think Tulela usually is, is looked at as a model too. One of the things that I do, um, so it's hard when you're on the academic research side, you can't really say that you think a model is good until you've done all this research to sort of test it and it's nobody has the resources yet to do that and it's sort of still too early so you get stuck. Um, so I've started to do two things. So when I train the students to look for codes, um, that they can use in any context, not just juvenile context, um, I tell them to look for tribes that clearly have recently updated their codes. So where a tribe has been doing significant work to um, sort of incorporate new ideas, you can tell by looking at the codes a lot if it's been recently updated. That is maybe a good um, place to start with. And then um, the other thing that I look for in looking for possible models is uh, something that matches in some way. So, so I work with a lot of um, at our school, we work with a lot of the tribes in Southern Nevada who are relatively small in terms of land base and population. So it's not necessarily that useful 
to look at um, a really extensive juvenile justice code from a community with a huge land base and a huge population. Um, and so uh, looking at uh, a tribe that's sort of similarly situated, so it might be sort of a neighboring tribe, um, it might be a tribe that, you know, if you don't have a juvenile detention center but you and you don't want one, then you know don't look at the code of a tribe that built it all around a major juvenile detention center. On the other hand, if you do, um, you might want to look um, at some of the tribes where the tribally run um, juvenile detention centers are located. Um, and, and so, so I sort of say look for things that are recently updated, and look for things um, that uh, look for tribes that sort of match you in some way. I do think um, so. Just from my own experience. Um, some of the tribes that I've worked with, so I know um, that Hopi, for example, is often a model that uh, that my students look at for uh, how to incorporate traditional approaches into the law in general, not necessarily specific to the juvenile code. Um, and they all they have recently updated their code um, and sort of done it frequently. And Navajo is, of course, always an example for um, a system to look at that has you know done a lot to incorporate these procedural approaches. Um, so you know you just gain the experience, and and if you know people, you can also ask. Um, but it's a hard question to figure out um, exactly what a model is. Great. We have another um, question in the questions pane asking where they get a copy of the model code. There's actually one attached to this presentation, but we can also um, follow up and email participants a copy of that as well. It looks like no one else has any other questions. Um, so we're going to conclude the webinar. These are the staff contacts if you have any follow-up questions for NCAI. Malia Villegas, uh, Sarah Topolsky, and Christina Snyder. Um, and our emails are there. And you can also call our office. Um, thank you all for, for your participation. And um, hope to see you again on another webinar.